Uh, that's right. So uh, diffusive in particular is particles. Although we saw that you cannot exchange particles without exchanging energy. And so uh, this was n, the number of particles. So if they uh, are in diffusive contact, they eventually reach a diffusive equilibrium. What quantity is going to be the same for both uh, systems if they are in diffusive equilibrium? Temperature, uh, chemical potential. Mu. Um, so, you know, again, we saw that if they're in diffusive contact, they're going to be in diffusive equilibrium, they're also going to be in thermodynamic equilibrium. So, yes, they're going to have the same temperature. But these are separate concepts. So, if we look at the, let's say, the thermodynamic identity, we had you know, energy, and then we have pairs um, of conjugate uh, variables. So this one, we had a temperature, and what is the conjugate variable of the temperature? Um, uh, the entropy. Okay. The entropy. And then we had, over oh, here we have the N, Yeah, I guess so. Uh, chemical potential. What is the conjugate variable of the chemical potential? The yeah. N. No, yeah, number of particles. So if we put the D over here, it will be the N. What is the other term that we have in the thermodynamic identity? Pressure, pressure, volume. Right. So if we have a kind of contact uh, for temperature, for the chemical potential, uh, what will be the, I guess, temperature is the same, chemical potential is the same, what will be the third kind of, uh, of contact? What can it, they uh, exchange if you put these two systems together? And what will be the same? The volume. <laughs> okay. What is it? The volume is the same, or they can exchange it. Yeah, they can exchange it. Okay. So exchange volume. What will be the same? What do you say? If they can exchange volume, what will be the same? The quantity that is the same for both? Ah, uh, the pressure. <laughs> awesome. How can we call this contact? This is a mechanical contact. will be in mechanical equilibrium. Does, uh, does it make sense that they can exchange volume, two systems? It's a funny way to say it, but it's actually like the most natural thing Say that you have um, some water over here, and then you put like a lead over here, um, and you know let's say that you have very good uh, 
how do you say it? Uh, very good contact here, right? So there's no uh, exchange of particles. Uh, if then you heat the um, water, evaporate some of it, then there's going to be a little bit less water and this is going to move up, right? Because you're going to have more particles in here that have been uh, evaporated. And so the pressure from this side is always one atmosphere. And where this is located, it's going to depend on uh, the vapor pressure over here. So it's always going to be equal to uh, one atmosphere also. But if you have more particles, then they need, <coughs> excuse me, more volume um, in order to have the same pressure. So they are exchanging volume over here. If there's a change uh, dx, then I guess the volumes, changing volume is gonna be well, changing volume over the area is dx. So the exchange volume, we have the same pressure on both sides. So it's pretty, I guess it's the, actually the most common um, situation. So if the process occurs at constant pressure, It is called um, an isobaric process. And this is you know a pretty important one because most things that we do, you know, for applications and uh, uh, doing experiments are going to be uh, at constant pressure, they're going to be isobaric. Okay, so this figure over here, it's similar to uh, 8.10 in uh, Italian Cromer. Okay. So consider a system. This is a little bit of a review. Um, it's also to see the, the similarities. So well, actually this is the reservoir, the system is here. And you know this reservoir is at some temperature tau. Then the first law of thermodynamics will tell us that the work is equal to the internal energy change in internal energy minus the the heat flow, dQ. So this is uh, dQ, if you want to express it 
in terms of uh, state variables. So it will be the derivative of the product of tau and sigma. And so the work to that. Uh, if the process is isothermal, that means that the temperature doesn't change, temperature is constant. Um, this would be Tau zero. Then the work done by the system is du minus tau d sigma. And so this is this one over here um, is the definition of what's well, the derivative of the free energy. So that is the free energy, the derivative of the free energy. That and then if it's isothermal, you get this one. So if the process is isothermal, the work done by the system is equal to the well, if you integrate it. So go to the free energy. This one is equation eight point thirty six. And oh, I guess I just call it the free energy, but it has a more uh, specific name. Uh, what, which free energy is this one? The one that we're talking about here, the internal energy, tau and sigma. Uh, Helmholtz free energy. put an extra L, but I think that's right. So, um, uh, so this one over here, you know, tau D sigma is the heat, uh, the heat flow, the heat received by the system. Okay, so, If the system, um, if work is done on the system, but there is no heat flow,
then uh, DQ is equal to zero. And in this case, uh, the W is going to be equal to the U. Okay, from this one over here. And this makes sense from an um, um, intuitive point of view. You have a you have a box. You squeeze it, so you do some work on it. Uh, but you don't let any heat flow in and out. So this is uh, just an isolated box. Then uh, the internal energy of the particles in the box or the material in the box will have to increase. If there is, I need to put it here. If there is heat transfer, but no work is done, then uh, so the DW will be equal to zero. And this implies that du is sigma d tau. which is a heat flow. So if no work is done on the system, you just have your box and you put energy in it, if you don't let the volume change, then all of that uh, heat goes into increasing the uh, internal energy of the system. So the, the energy of the particles. And in the more general case, if work is done on the system, uh, it will be actually this one. And work done on system. Uh, weak heat transfer. Then the work done is equal to uh, the change um, is the infinitesimal work is a change in the free energy. So Okay. So now if we have a system that is also in mechanical equilibrium, we're going to have uh, an extra term. The extra term is gonna be the derivative of the product of the pressure and the volume. And so then we'll have, uh, wait, is that a positive? Uh, yeah, well, I'm just gonna talk about it separately. This is a negative, and this is minus VDP and PDP. Okay, cool. If the process is uh, 
isobaric then the p will be zero and this is going to be uh, i feel like this should be a positive but Uh, this one is zero, so you only have this one. Okay. Question, isn't it the B, D, B, the work? Um, True. Yes, it is the work. So that's what we're going to see. So why did you put two words? One, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So let me, let me continue. Okay. So um, so I just wanted you to see this uh, thing like with all the terms right now. But let's look at the individual uh, ones. So when we had um, uh, thermal equilibrium, so thermal contact, you increase uh, the temperature increase the temperature of the reservoir so the system has to increase its temperature also and what the free energy is telling you is that not all the the, the energy the internal energy is available to the work. What this term uh, gives you or tells you is the amount of energy that is trapped, you know, is, is required in order to maintain that uh, increased temperature. Okay, so this is energy that is not available to do to the work. Uh, and that's why we subtract it from the internal energy. We call this one the Helmholtz free energy. So when we have uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, no matter um, what kind of work you do, some of that work will have to be done against the atmosphere or against the, the constant um, pressure medium in which you are. And in a similar fashion, some of that work that has to be done um, against the atmosphere is not available to do useful work for you. you know, that's that's a, a price that you have to pay just for being in the, in the constant uh, pressure. So um, that energy, in a way, it's also trapped. So let's call this one This is called the useful work. So it's DW prime. Um, sorry, not useful, effective work. So 
So the effective work is equal to the total work plus the derivative of the pressure and the volume. So um, Alejandro, you're right that this one is a, is a work. Uh, this is the work that you do against uh, constant pressure atmosphere. So uh, then this one is going to be uh, du, so getting the work from the first law of, of thermodynamics, du minus dq plus the derivative of the product of the pressure and the volume. So this is equation 0.37. So we are going to define uh, a quantity And H, the letter H, is going to stand for this quantity. This quantity is uh, U plus PV. So that means that the derivative of this quantity, and you can see that you know it is composed of only um, state variables and so h is also a state variable so the derivative of h is derivative of u plus the derivative of the product of uh, p and b this is equation 8.38 okay so now we can rewrite this effective work. There's a prime over there as the derivative of H minus the heat flow. What is the name of this quantity H? Uh, enthalpy. Nice. Have you uh, encountered this quantity before in other classes or your experiments, your work? In chemistry, but I never pay attention in chemistry. <laughs> yep. So um, H is the enthalpy. So at constant pressure, Um, the enthalpy has the same role as the internal energy. Well, it's the internal energy <coughs> um, at constant volume. All right, so um, we're going to talk more about the enthalpy, but I'm, I'm going to continue um, with the 
analysis of this equation. So now this one looks the same as um, the one that we had before. Oh, sorry, this one. Yeah. Except that we have compressed terms into uh, not compressed, I would say consolidated uh, terms. So I guess I'm going to do it over here. So if no work is done, um, so no effective. If no effective work uh, is done, then this W dW prime is equal to zero. The H, the change in the enthalpy is equal to the heat flow. So you know, this is an interesting one. Let's say that you have a solid, um, you know, a small aluminum cube or something, and you heat it up then uh, the solid is going to, well, this cube is going to expand. So the, actually a solid is not the best. Think, you know, just a, a cube of uh, a, an ideal gas. You, and this is in mechanical equilibri equilibrium with the atmosphere. I guess maybe like a balloon or something like that. Um, you uh, uh, allow some heat to flow in, and this is going to expand. Uh, but all the work that is done by that expansion is against the uh, the atmosphere. So the effective work done is zero. If you wanted to actually use this balloon to do some like real work, you know, move a crankshaft or something like that. Um, oh, I guess most balloons are spherical. So, you know, let's say that it's connected to some other device you want to put some heat in it, and so it expands. And um, if it expands, it can move, you know, these, these parts over here. So the movement of this part is the effective work, you know, the, the work that is actually useful to you. But when you are expanding it, uh, some of the work, in some cases, most, and if you don't have anything here, then all of it, is work that has to be done against the atmosphere. So you're not actually taking advantage of it. You're only taking advantage of you know, the piece that you're moving over here. And even if you have something like a piston, let's say, um, you know, that can move up and down with some explosion, uh, the work you know, that you do over here that you can use to, to move your car um, in this case, it's probably most of it, but it's not the only work that has to be done. There's also like atmosphere over here that has to be removed. And so there's always this part over here, the work that is done against the constant pressure uh, atmosphere that is not, that is not usable. Um, okay, so. Another 
uh, a good example uh, of this one, in which you do no effective work, is if you are just vaporizing, let's say that you're boiling water, and this is in the in the open atmosphere, it's an open container. Then the particles you know, are going to become gas. Um, so they're going to push up against the atmosphere. Uh, this is another case in which no effective work uh, is done because you know, you're just letting the particles escape. So all the work that is done is against the atmosphere, which is not useful uh, to you. And um, in this particular case, and maybe you saw it in chemistry, the latent heat of uh, vaporization is going to be equal to the to the enthalpy. So you can measure the enthalpy of different substances that way. So another scenario If the effective work, so there is effective work. Uh, I guess I can get from this one. There is effective work, so you have the dW prime. Uh, but whatever process you're looking at is at constant uh, pressure. And constant temperature. So in this case, the DP um, term is going to be zero, and also the D tau is going to be zero. So when you expand this one, um, you're going to get The W prime is equal to uh, du minus tau d sigma plus pdb. Um, so we said that this one is a Helmholtz free energy. So the effective work is equal to the free energy plus PDB. So we can define another quantity. This one is going to be called. G, capital G. Um, it's going to be the free energy, um, sorry, plus the product of PV. So the derivative of this quantity is the F plus derivative of PV. And since this is at constant pressure, the dp term is equal to zero, then the change in the effective work is equal to the change in this quantity, uh, this one. So any prediction on what is the name of this quantity g?
when we started the class talking about it. So G is the Gibbs free energy. And so I guess you can contrast, compare the Gibbs free energy with the Helmholtz free energy. So physicists usually use uh, the Helmholtz free energy and chemists usually use the Gibbs free energy. Um, that is mainly for practical purposes. Most of the chemical reactions that a chemist does, or I don't know, uh, prepares, I guess, um, are going to be at constant pressure. And for the most part, they're also going to be at constant temperature. And so the Gibbs free energy is the thermodynamic variable that makes more sense to use. So the Helmholtz free energy was the internal energy mm. or should I write this one? Uh, all these pieces are nice. So the Helmholtz free energy uh, was uh, internal energy. Minus the energy required to maintain the temperature and the Gibbs free energy. We have it over here. Positive is going to depend on um, because this is for work done on the atmosphere. Uh, the Gibbs free energy is the um, internal energy minus the work that is required to be done against the atmosphere in order to keep the pressure constant uh, on, on the other side. So if you talk to a chemist or if you read chemistry papers and they say free energy, it's a Gibbs free energy. If you read uh, papers in physics, then when it says free energy is usually gonna be the Helmholtz. Um, okay, so now let's look at the chemical work. Alejandro, why you didn't pay attention to your chemistry class? Because I thought I was not going, I was not going to use it since I was studying physics. So I just did the exams and passed the class and that's it. Okay. Yeah. Physics can explain all of chemistry. Yeah. Thermodynamics can explain most of chemistry. Okay, so chemical work. So chemical work is the work done by the transfer of particles. Uh, 
Um, it is called chemical work. So, I guess mm, the use of word chemical makes things a little bit confusing. Um, so it's called chemical work because you do work against the chemical potential. And the chemical potential is called like that, I guess for historical reasons, but typically when you, I guess when I talk about chemistry, uh, I mean that, you know, there is something that is going on with the bonds. So the bonds are breaking. So in this case, uh, that is not accurate that you're not breaking any bonds in the particles of your, of your gas or whatever. It's just that you have to go uphill or downhill, I suppose, uh, in the chemical potential. So the uh, thermodynamic identity, uh, the U, have tau, d sigma, minus PDV plus mu dn. And that is equation 8.49. So you get a pointer for where we are. Although, you know, this is, we have been uh, using the thermodynamic identity since like chapter two. So the U, from what we had before, is the uh, effective work plus tau V sigma uh, minus PDV. So that means that these two quantities uh, are equal. So tau d sigma minus PDB plus mu dn is effective work plus tau d sigma minus PDB. So these terms go away. And so you have uh, this over here. So the, this is the effective, effective work. The effective work is equal to the total work plus PDV. So that means that mu dn, uh, this guy over here, is equal to the total work plus PDV. So the total work, no prime over here, although that should be crossed. Is mu dn minus PDB. This is equation. So this is the mechanical work and this is the chemical work. And again, this is not really like a chemical reaction. It just means that uh, is work done by the chemical uh, against the chemical potential uh, when you 
move uh, particles. So then we defined the chemical work DW subscript C as mu dn. And this one is equation 51. Okay. So now we can consider a situation which is also fairly common. In which in which dv equals zero, so the volume uh, doesn't change. And you can think maybe about two, um, you know, tanks of compressed gas or something. Like if you work in the lab, you know, hydrogen or helium or oxygen, you have these tanks that, that are at constant volume. And uh, this thing over here, it's a pump. So you can imagine that it has like, you know, space for one particle. And so, you know, it goes over here. So I maybe it looks kind of like this. Um, only one side, I guess. So, you know, particle gets in here. And then you rotate it. So you do work. And you know it goes to this side, and um, another particle can move to the other side. So you can kind of do work like uh, by moving one particle by one particle. And this is, a, of course, a thought of experiment, but it's not that different from uh, what you do in reality. So in this case. You have uh, two systems, so S1 and S2. And each one has its uh, energy. Uh, so T1, uh, U1, temperature, T1, chemical potential, U1, number of particles, N1, and this one has it's things too. Um, okay, so then the total chemical work, and you know, we're assuming constant volume. The total chemical work is the chemical work done by or on system one plus the chemical work done or by system two. And so then the total work, chemical work is going to be um, mu one d n one and mu two d n two. But if you let d n be equal to d n two.
and you're moving particles from one system to the other, then dn is going to be minus d n1. Uh, then you can rewrite this one. So it'll be mu1 uh, negative negative mu1 dn plus mu2 dn. So the chemical work is mu2 minus mu1 dn. So that one is equation uh, 8.52. So this gives you a different uh, perspective, different uh, way to look at it uh, of the chemical of the chemical potential. So the chemical potential is the difference in the chemical potential between two substances, and you know the work that is needed to move one particle from one system to the other. Okay, so we can look at this one. Uh, this system, but let's constrain it a little bit more. So now these two systems, the whole thing, they are in contact with a reservoir. And so the reservoir is at temperature T. And it means that you know, the reservoir is much bigger. And so these temperatures are going to be not just the same, but also constant. Uh, so you can do this um, reproduce the same process but now the temperature is also constant and say that we have a an ideal gas uh, in there so if the chemical potentials are different but the substance is the same uh, both are ideal gases uh, where is the difference in the chemical potential coming from? Well, it will be just the number of particles um, divided by the volume that you have on each side. Right? So if one has more particles per volume, so higher density, then the chemical potential is going to be higher. That means that the gas will want to flow in the opposite direction to where there is less density. So the chemical potential, um, well, this is the, the reservoir is down here, but we also want to define densities. So density of one is the number of particles uh, one divided by volume one, and and two is number of particles in the system two divided by volume two. Doesn't really matter uh, which one is greater than the other. You know, we can just we could just switch them. But assume that one of them is larger than the other. And um, yeah, also we have that dv is equal to zero. So the chemical potential for an ideal gas
we derived it before, and I think we have done homework with it. It's a tau natural log of n divided by the quantum concentration. So that means that the difference in the chemical potential uh, is going to be tau, applying everything, natural log of N2 minus natural log of quantum concentration minus natural log of N1 plus natural log of quantum concentration. So the quantum concentrations can slap. Wait a second. You know, they are the same gas, the same temperature, so the quantum concentrations are the same. And so, this change in the chemical potential, the difference is tau natural log of N2 divided by N1. This is equation 8.53. So the other way to um, oh, I guess we can also uh, integrate the work. So the integral of the chemical work is going to be the integral of mu two minus mu one times dn. The mu's don't depend um, directly on the end, so we can take them out. And we have this term over here. So it's tau natural log of N2 divided by N1, then the integral of the N. So the chemical work is n tau natural log of n2 divided by n1. Uh, this one is equation. Hmm. I guess it's going to be 854. But we can also get the, the work directly. So we have that for the ideal gas, PB uh, equals NT. So the work is minus PDB from some volume one. To another volume too. So P is NT divided by B. So this is going to be DB over B. And so the work. is nt, the integral of this one is natural log um, of natural log of b. This is evaluated from b1 to b2. I would have a negative over here in the definition of work. And so this is gonna be minus NT natural log of V2 divided by V1. So, well, 
minus we want, so we can divide it. And then we have the negative, so we can switch these ones. And we actually have the condition that uh, dv was equal to zero, but we also have the condition that um, the concentration is equal to n by the divided by the volume. So you can switch these ones with the term of the concentration, and it would be n2 divided by n1. So if you calculate the work this way, you know, from the traditional PDV, you get the same as with the chemical uh, work. And so what this shows you is that uh, you can, well, the, the works are, are equivalent. Uh, if you're doing chemical work by moving one particle at a time, uh, you do, um, you also do mechanical work. Well, I guess it's the same thing. Um, because you're moving against uh, a pressure. Uh, all right. So I'm going to stop over here. And I'm going to stop recording.